Sup you beautiful people. Hope you've had a fantastic day. Welcome back to another new episode of What If Deku Joined the League of Villains. If you guys enjoy this what if, comment down below and let me know. And go ahead and check out other what ifs in the channel, after watching this video. Before we get into it though, don't forget to subscribe and leave a like, and also share this video with your friends. So let's start this video. In an alleyway near Kamino, Reza gazed at the force in front of her if it could be described as that. From what she could see, there were between 20 and 30 men and women all looking at her with hostile intent. The reason, atrocity had sent them. Apparently, he wanted information on the people he was looking for, and even extended an offer to join his group, considering how strong she was. However, Razor being, Razor politely told him and his entire organization to go fuck themselves. He didn't take it well and sent this group here to deal with her. We won't ask again Razor, one of the hostels declared. But because I won't refuse again, Razor retorted. The hostels were irritated now. Razor was just plain pissed off because these guys were just annoying her. I'm surprised Atrocity sent his bitches to see me rather than coming himself. Too scared is. Razor sneered. The hostels looked at each other uncomfortably. Master is busy dealing with other problems. One that relates to someone in the underworld. Anyone, I know. Razor asked in trip. She was somewhat curious now. The hostels looked at each other again. The asshole he is dealing with goes by the name of Shiro. He said you'd met him before. Razor said nothing. The thug wasn't wrong. She had met him, and it was less than pleasant. Shiro was the leader of the biggest criminal organization in the underworld. He was a sadistic bastard who rivaled atrocity and often fought with him. His personality may have, though she couldn't say for sure, worsened since losing his eye. Yeah, I've met him. Guy's a complete asshole like your boss, Razor replied mockingly. The group of thugs were getting annoyed now. Enough. Shouted a female member. Either come with us now, or we take you by force. Razor snorted at the threat. I'd love to see you try, Razor taunted with a sadistic grin. Actually no, do try. It'll more fun than talking. The enemy group started to advance towards her. Razor greeted it with enthusiasm. However, she called out to them before charging. Tell you what. Since you're all just a bunch of pathetic idiots who are doing this out of fear, I'll grant you a small act of mercy, Razor declared much to their confusion. Atrocity will give you either a slow death or a shitload of torture, if you fail here, right? So, I'll make sure that each of your deaths is quick and painless. The enemy force halted their advance. Some stared at her dumbfounded, others stared at her confused, while some thugs just glared at her. However, they all did the same action next. They laughed at Razor, very hard. Some were shouting taunts about her being crazy and thinking she could take them all. Razor just continued to smile sadistically. Most groups of opponents she faced acted that way. It was why they normally died, and why this one would die now. She would keep her promise about slaughtering them quickly. It was certainly a lot better than dealing with atrocity afterwards. Most of them didn't have human features, making it all more serious. Despite Atrocity's racist views towards subhumans, he allowed them in his group because he viewed them as expendable. And because he could get a kick out of torturing them if they failed. Razor dashed forward at incredible speed. Before anyone could react, she raised her right leg, swung it with a blade emerging from the sole of her foot, and slit the man's throat. He was dead in an instant. There was a momentary silence of shock from the group about what had just happened. Taking advantage of this, Razor kicked the guy she killed and sent him crashing into several others. She then somersaulted into the air, spun, and released several knives from her hands at her selected targets. Each one hit a target straight in the head, killing them quickly. Thirteen people, including the one from the start, were now dead. Atrocity's thugs had finally got their senses together and began to fight back, realizing they would be dead if they didn't. A man with a rhino appearance charged at her at a high speed. Razor was faster, however. Two katanas appeared in her hands, and then she moved towards the advancing foe. In an instant, she was behind him with her sword stretched out. The rhino man fell after realizing his stomach had been slashed open. He was dead seconds later. Three individuals, his quirks revolved around shooting bullets, opened fire on Razor. Much to their surprise, she blocked each one fired at her while running towards them. Becoming more desperate, the three of them fired everything they had recklessly at Razor. And as a result, they killed five of their allies. Upon reaching them Razor slashed them across their chests. That left only eight enemies. The woman with hawk-like features flew at Razor in an attempt to take her up into the sky and drop her. Two of the women were dashing towards Razor as well. They both had cat-like features and from Razor's perspective, looked like they were sisters. The cats attacked in a coordinated fashion by attempting to scratch and kick Razor at different moments. The hawk tried clawing at Razor. However, Razor dodged each of their attacks by stepping and flipping with relative ease. These guys are way too slow Razor thought. Their attacks are predictable, but, at the same time, well coordinated. I think it's time I ended this though. Razor held her arms in as she got between the girls. She was going to impale them both with her quirk, but they guessed what she was doing and flipped away in retreat. Smart move Razor thought. As the hawk attempted to claw at her face, Razor grabbed its ankles, somersaulted into the air, and slammed it down on the ground. 
Before the hawk could react, Razor planted her feet at its chest and impaled it with two blades. The hawk coughed up some blood before dying. Razor felt something grab at her, and saw it was a man with a cactus fur hat extending his arms to hold her. Next, a woman that was completely purple unleashed gas from her body at Razor. Probably poison Razor assumed. She wasn't waiting to find out. Razor kicked back at full force towards her captor with a sharp sword shooting from her back. The cactus man was stabbed and killed instantly. Razor then shot two knives. One for the purple woman and the other for a porcupine man standing right next to her. They each connected with their targets leaving only four left. However, when Razor turned to her remaining adversaries, she noticed them crouched down and staring at the ground with scared and despairing looks. In addition to the cat girls, Razor noticed a man with the appearance of a cyclops, and a man, or rather a teenager, with the features belonging to a shark, though more humanoid. Not gonna attack me? She asked mockingly. What's the point? The shark boy replied sadly. It's not like it will do us any good. The cyclops and one of the cats were crying. The other cat was angry. It doesn't matter what we do. We're dead either way, she declared bitterly. Razor was curious about something. Why are you with atrocities group exactly? He hates people like you. He refers to them as subhumans. So just why? She questioned. Eat because we don't want to die, the cyclops sobbed. We were forced to join his group, the other cat added. Said if we didn't, we'd die right then and there. So that was their reason. Fear. Razor really couldn't blame them. It was atrocity after all. The sick fuck did things that made her look like a nice person. Sometimes she think about how she'd kill him if she ever got the chance, considering he disgusted her in ways very few could. On a side note, Razor expressed a rare level of pity and sympathy for these people for their situation. They had tried to kill her sure, but hey, who hadn't? Despite her job, and barring individuals she didn't like, she took no pleasure in killing. She was indifferent towards it, but otherwise didn't enjoy it. Since these people were no longer trying to kill her, and she wasn't on a mission, Razor decided to play good guy for once. There was one thing she needed to deal with first, however. I understand I really do, but, if I don't kill you guys the League of Villains might think I'd gone soft, and I'd lose respect, Razor declared, causing the people to flinch. But first, I'd better take care of our little spy. Without warning, Razor spawned a knife and threw it at a nearby bee. She had noticed it at the start of the fight, and planned on killing it at the end. It connected and ended its life. Atrocities base. Kuhn gasped at the sudden surge of pain she was feeling. Blood leaked down from her eye where her bees were contained. She did manage to catch a glimpse of the last minute of her bee's life. Damn you Razor, she growled. Damn you to hell. Back at the alleyway. Razor's enemies were surprised at what just happened until she explained it. There wasn't any time to waste, however. I'd suggest that you run and probably move to a different country, or at least a different part of Japan, Razor suggested. That way you'll be safe from atrocity. And before you ask why I'm doing this, know that's it's because I see no real reason to kill any of you now that you've ceased attacking me. The group didn't know how to respond to that. Taking a closer look at her foes, Razor noticed something about the shark boy. He looked rather young, younger than Izuku. Hey shark boy, she addressed the boy who flinched when she spoke to him. How old are you? The boy appeared confused at the question. 10, he answered. Razor's eyes widened. Villains come in different sizes and ages but seriously, a 10 year old. Izuku was at least in his teens when he became a villain. You're 10, and you're a fucking villain. Shouldn't you be in school? Where are your parents? Razor questioned. The boy cringed at those questions but answered nonetheless. They're dead, he sniffed. I got thrown out of my own home and placed in a foster system where my life has been complete hell. School is no different. You think it's growing up looking like this. People look at me like I'm some sort of monster and accuse me of trying to eat someone when I've done nothing like that. I didn't want to be a villain, neither did anyone here, but society hates us because of what we look like, and it's not our fault. Razor said nothing. She knew this sort of discrimination existed but didn't see much of it. So, you're outcasts then, just like the Quirkless, Razor murmured. They all nodded. Oddly enough, Quirkless people often made it with individuals whose forms took on that of animals or something that wasn't human. They were outcasts so they could relate to each other. Get out of here now before I change my mind, Razor ordered. And they did. They left quickly without saying a word. Razor sighed. The world was truly a fucked up place. Class 1A dorms. It was Saturday at UA, and most students were lying in because of how tired they were from their weekly lessons. There were a few up, however. Izuku was up slightly later than usual. He didn't sleep in normally, but today he just felt like it. He got up and did his usual workout and had a shower afterwards. When he was finished, he got dressed in his casual clothes, turquoise t-shirt and black trousers. He headed to the common area and saw that Shoto was there staring off into space. Morning, Izuku greeted him. Shoto looked up with a stoic expression. Morning. Izuku moved to the kitchen area and began making tea. I'm surprised you are not sleeping in, Shoto murmured softly. Considering what went down last night. I could say the same thing about you, Izuku countered. Couldn't sleep. Not really, Shoto answered. Last night I was feeling nervous about today. Izuku frowned. He then remembered their conversation from earlier in the week. This about seeing your mother. 
he asked. Choro said nothing but nodded in confirmation. He waited a couple of seconds before speaking again. It's been 10 years since I've seen her, and our last time together wasn't pleasant, Shoto admitted. I'm just scared that's all. When I come face to face with her, what am I supposed to say? Do I tell her about the past 10 years? About my brother? About the abuse I've put up with? I just don't know. Izuku could sympathize with Shoto in that area. I know how you feel. When the police brought my mom to the hospital to see me I was terrified. I wasn't sure how to explain all of this to her, part of me didn't want to because I had changed, Izuku explained. I was a villain, not the son she remembered. However, I eventually decided to tell her the truth because I owed it to her. I wanted her to know so I could be near her again. Believe me when I say, seeing your mother and telling her everything is for the best. Shoto considered this for a second. I guess you're right, he agreed. I'll avoid talking about my brother though. It might be better to talk about that only after I've spoken with her a couple of times. Izuku couldn't argue against that. Considering Shoto's mother's condition, that sort of news was likely to do her harm. He had been told about Shoto's brother's fate the day they walked back from recovery girl's office. If you don't mind me asking, how did you change? What sort of person were you before becoming a villain? Shoto asked. Izuku thought about this. I was a very different person back then, he answered. I was a shy, insecure hero attacker. I was nice to everyone I came across, despite how most treated me. Like most children, I wanted to be a hero like everyone else, despite not having a quirk. Though that ended a year ago. I was sort of a coward back then because of how I was bullied. I never fought back or got help due to not wanting to cause anyone trouble. I was a lonely type as well because I didn't have any friends after being outed as quirkless. I did quirk analysis as I do now. Also, physically speaking, I was a lot weaker and my hair was fluffy and green. Shoto listened with curiosity. Hearing about the type of person Izuku was back then and comparing him to the one he is now. Shoto thought they were drastically different. I was the same. I never had friends because of my upbringing, so I was mostly alone. You know what happened to my mother and older brother. My sister Fayumi stayed around for me, always treating my wounds after training sessions. My brother Natsu left and moved in with my mom's parents because he was afraid of my father, though I can't really blame him, Shoto said. Izuku was surprised to hear about the rest of Shoto's family. His sister sounded like a good person, his brother, well, he didn't know what to make of him. There was an odd moment of silence between them. As strange as it was, Shoto was frighteningly similar to him as they could relate in many ways. Speaking of visiting mothers, Izuku said changing the subject. Mine's visiting today. Part of Yue's attempt to make this all more bearable for me. She'll be here in two hours or so. That caught Shoto's interest. He had heard a little bit about what Izuku's mother was like, but had never actually met her. By the way, what were things like on the roof last night? Izuku asked. Shoto chuckled at that question, earning him a curious look from Izuku. Well, during that emotional display between Tokoyami and Dark Shadow, Kaminari started to cry seriously. He was so overwhelmed with emotion that he blew his nose into Aizawa's scarf, Shoto exclaimed. It took Izuku seconds to register what Shoto just said. Wait. What? He shouted incredulously. Yue entrance, two hours later. Inko had seen what Yue was like on TV and had read about it, but to be here in person was another thing altogether. The place was huge, and the estate built was impressive. While she was marveling at it all someone, her son, came to greet her. Mom, I'm so glad to see you, Izuku greeted warmly. How was your week? How was work? The two embrace. I'm glad to see you too sweetie, Inko replied. My week was mostly fine. Work as well. What about you? How was your first week at UA? Eventful, Izuku replied bluntly. That was the only word to describe it. I'll tell you all about it once we're at the dorm. Most of the students have gone out for the day. Inko wondered if that included Katsuki. She still had a few words for him. Unbeknownst to them, they were being observed by Nido Manama. He had just been going out for a walk when he saw them talking. He figured Inko was Izuku's mother judging by their resemblance. Then he called her mom, and that confirmed it. Nido was still angry at Izuku for what happened yesterday. Now he could no longer mock class A in any way. Worse still, Izuku had caused him to reveal some of his secrets to his teacher in a terrible way. He had never been so angry and humiliated in his entire life. And now, watching Izuku look so happy with his mother caused him to feel a strong sense of envy. Why? It's what he would have liked if he was with his mother. Flashback. The six-year-old Nido was being tucked into bed by his mother. She was a young woman from who Nido inherited his facial features from. Though he had been told once or twice that he had his father's hair and eyes. Nido sometimes wondered where his father was and why he was not with them, though his other did say it was because he was living far away. He didn't really understand why though. For the first few years of his life, Nido was raised by his mother. They did almost everything together. Walks, play, stories etc. He treasured every moment he spent with her. Good night mom, Nido murmured tiredly. Good night darling, she cooed softly. Sweet dreams. She put him to bed every night and woke him up every morning. She was with him every chance he got. He loved her deeply and wished they could be together forever. 
Unfortunately, it was not to be. A short while after that his mother's life was claimed in a car accident caused by a villain attack. When she died, Nito felt like a part of his soul had been ripped out. He had cried for days and rebuked any attempts of comfort, wanting to be on his own. At his mother's funeral, he didn't cry, as he was trying to be strong. When most had left, he stayed behind at his mother's grave for what felt like an eternity. He didn't even care that it was raining, though he couldn't feel it. It was only then that he realized someone was holding an umbrella over him. Upon turning to see who it was he came face to face with a tall man whose face appeared solemn. That wasn't all though. He had blonde hair and eyes matching his. At first, he couldn't believe it, but when the man spoke, he had no choice. Hello Nito. My name is Mondai Tezuka, and I'm your father, he said softly. You're going to be living with me from now on. And that's when his life became truly hellish. Flashback end. Watching Izuku now, and seeing how happy he was with his mother, made Nito's heart blaze with envy. He wanted to scream at Izuku but held himself back. Then an idea formed in his mind. A way to get back at him. Since his mother was here he could let tell her all sorts of things about him. Things that would get him in trouble. This caused a smile to form across his face. He was about to walk over when he noticed Izuku glaring at him. It wasn't a normal glare, however. It was a death glare. Izuku had noticed Nito a few seconds before and guessed what he was planning. And so, he shot him a death glare, one that said, I will break you if you try anything. No matter what you've been through, or what you think of me, my mother is off limits, Izuku mouthed. Nito was intelligent enough to get the message. He turned heel and proceeded to walk in a different direction. He couldn't quite explain it, but in that instant, he was very afraid of Izuku. He reminded him of his family, his father's family. Izuku is something wrong. Inko asked her son. No, he assured her. Let's just get to the dorm. Not seeing a reason to question it Inko went willingly with her son. Class 1A dorm common room. Inko marveled at the mansion her son was living in. It seemed like something only the wealthy could afford to live in. How the teachers had managed to do this in such a short amount of time she didn't know. There was someone there to greet them. Morning Midoriya. Tanya greeted. How are you two? Tanya noticed he wasn't alone. He was also quick to notice the resemblance between Izuku and the woman, making him realize who she was. Oh, hello there. My name is Tenya Iida, the class president. Tenya greeted her politely as he offered out his hand to shake. Would you be Midoriya's mother by any chance? Inko shook Tenya's hand. Yes. My name is Inko Midoriya, she replied. Pleased to meet you. When she thought about his name she immediately remembered who he was. You're that boy who fought with my son and a few others in Hosu, right? She asked. Tenya's eyes widened. She knew about that. Ah, uh, mom, people don't know about Iida's involvement in that, so please don't go mentioning it randomly, Izuku requested. The teachers know but others don't. I'm so sorry, Inko apologized immediately. I didn't know. It's alright, Tenya reassured her. Tenya had only heard about Izuku's mother, but meeting her in person, she really did resemble her son. They all sat down. Now then, why don't you tell me about your first week here, Inko suggested. I want to know every detail. The whole week. Tenya questioned. Inko nodded. Starting from when he arrived here. Tenya looked at Izuku who simply shrugged. Yeah. All of it, he informed him. Inko was confused by that response. Tenya stood up and walked to the kitchen. I'd better make tea then because it's going to be a long talk, he pointed out. I'll do an Iida family special. And so, Izuku began telling his mother about his week. Shoto Todoroki. Shoto walked along at a regular pace. He'd be lying if he said he wasn't nervous right now, though that was to be expected. As he walked, he remembered the last time he'd interacted with his mother and the things she'd said to him. He knew it wasn't her fault for acting that way, the blame was all on his father. As he arrived at the hospital he wondered how she'd react to seeing him again. He had wanted to visit her so many times but never did. He was afraid of what seeing his left side would do to her, the pain it might cause her. He was also scared of telling her about his brother. Regardless of what's happened in the past we will always be bound by blood, my father's abuse, and my siblings showed a thought. He entered the hospital and greeted the receptionist. He asked for Rei Todoroki and explained who he was, much to their shock, before they let him go and see her. He stood outside a room reaching for the handle. There was no going back now. He had to do this. Izuku's words echoed in his ears. The words his mother and brother spoke to him echoed in his ears. They made him want to do this. If I'm never going to master these powers. If I'm never going to move forward. If I'm never going to become a hero, then I need to do this Shoto decided. There's so much we need to talk about. He opened the door and entered the room. He closed the door and looked to see his mother looking out the window. After staring at her for a minute, Shoto finally spoke. Hello mom, he greeted. Very flinched at being called that word. It had been so long since she was called that. She turned to catch a glimpse of who had entered. When she saw who it was Ray felt her heart stop for a second. She couldn't believe her eyes. It had been 10 years since she saw him, but she knew. She couldn't forget even if she tried. Shoto was taller, older, and more serious looking. He had a large scar across his left side, caused by her, which she felt immense guilt upon seeing. At the same time, she was overjoyed at seeing him again after all these years. Her little boy, all grown up. 
From Shoto's perspective, Rei didn't look as though she had aged at all. She looked tired and weak, but living in a hospital like this for 10 years would have that effect on anyone. He took a step towards her, and she started crying. Shoto froze thinking this was a bad idea. I'm sorry, Rei sobbed. I'm so sorry. Shoto stared at her surprised. Back then I hurt you in the worst possible way. I didn't mean, I didn't want to, she sobbed. I'm so sorry Shoto. Please forgive me. Shoto smiled warmly at her. I forgave you a long time ago, Shoto told her. I never bore any hatred towards you either because I knew it wasn't your fault. Rei stopped crying and stared at her son. If anything, I'm sorry for not coming to see you sooner, Shoto continued. It's only because of someone that I was able to decide this. It's also because of that person that I was able to use my left side for the first time. Rei raised an eyebrow at that. That person told it was my power, not his, and said not to let anyone tell me otherwise, Shoto explained. Rei was surprised to hear that. Though at the same time, she agreed. Shoto's quirk may have come from her and Angie, but at the end of the day it was his to use, not theirs. I'm glad, she murmured. I want you to be happy and save people. That's what I've always wanted for you. The moment she said that Shoto felt as though a large weight had been lifted from his chest. In that instant, any resentment he felt towards his left side diminished. Deciding he waited long enough, Shoto moved towards his mother and pulled her into a hug. Rei returned by wrapping her arms around him. They had both wanted this for so long. I've missed you, mom, Shoto said softly. I've missed you so much. I've missed you too Shoto, more than you can imagine, she replied. Class 1A dorms. Inko was sipping down tea faster than she should have, which was to be expected after hearing all that. She couldn't believe all of that happened in a week. When she heard about the fight Suzuku had been in she nearly fainted as she couldn't believe her son had been through all of that. She was amazed to discover Izuku had stood up to Endeavor and several bullies, as well as the part about Monoma in Class 1B. Inko was somewhat horrified when she heard about what happened with Hatsume, but quickly got over it when he explained how things calmed down. She was happy at how he helped some of the students as well, it showed he was still the same nice boy she remembered. I still can't believe you did that with Monoma, Tanya admitted. He had it coming, Izuku replied indifferently. I was sick of his taunts, so I did something about it. Besides, if he wants to be a hero he'd better start taking it seriously. I suppose, Tanya agreed. Inko sighed. It was nice to know her son was getting on well at UA. She was surprised Katsuki hadn't done anything to him, however. Maybe UA had put a leash on him. Inko took another sip of tea. This is delicious eat it, Inko said softly. Your family came up with this. Tanya smiled proudly. Yes. My grandmother was an avid lover of tea and purchased all kinds, he boasted. Eventually she got the urge to create her own. Leading to the one we are now drinking. What a wonderful hobby, Inko complimented. I agree, Izuku said as he took another sip. Then without thinking he said something else. Gentle would definitely love this. Tenya and Inko looked at him confused. Is gentle? Inko asked. Izuku looked up surprised at what he just said. Is he someone you knew while you were with the league? Tenya asked. Izuku decided it wouldn't be harmful to tell them. Yes, he's someone I knew, he confirmed. He wasn't a member of the league though, just someone I encountered while I was out doing quirk analysis. Gentle is a villain, but not your typical one. Tanya and Inko were both curious about what Izuku meant. Gentle, or better known as the Gentle Criminal, is a villain that rules the media world. He commits crimes and then uploads them online so people will know who he is. He's a rather polite individual, and mostly centers his crimes around thievery, since he isn't big into violence. However, when the time comes, he will fight if he must. Unlike most villains, he does what he does for fame, so that he can carve his name into the fabric of history for many to remember, Izuku explained. He and I met a couple of times before we started talking. Eventually, we started having tea together along with a friend of his. It was a nice break from what I usually did. Inko and Tenyu were surprised at what they were hearing. Villains really did come in all shapes and forms. I think I've seen a few of his videos online, Inko said. He's a blonde man with a fancy jetup, isn't he? Izuku nodded in confirmation. That's him. Tenyu made a mental note to look him up later. Inko looked at her watch. I'd better go, she said standing up. I don't want to keep you from doing your work. Izuku stood up and hugged her. I'm glad you came to visit, Izuku told her. I'm glad I came. It was nice to meet you too Ida, Inko replied. The pleasure is all mine, Tenya said. Inko promised to visit her son next week and left the building. As she came near the entrance she spotted a familiar face, and anger filled up within her. She marched right up to him, catching him by surprise. Mrs. Midoriya, what are you? He started. Smack. Inko smacked Katsuki across the face with all the strength she could muster. Katsuki staggered slightly before turning to stare at her with a dumbfounded expression. I'm here because I came to see my son, she yelled. The same one you told to jump off a roof and be reborn with a cork in another life. The same one you beat insulted and scarred every day of his life. And don't you dare tell me otherwise. You drove him to the point where he almost committed suicide. Katsuki stared at her in shock. 
For as long as he had known Inko, he had never seen her this angry, or at all even. The teachers are aware of what you put Izuku through, and they decided you should be allowed to stay because it happened before you ate, Inko continued. Personally, I don't see how someone like you could become a hero. Heroes are meant to be good and inspire others, not bully and oppress them. Katsuki flinched at being told that. He had never thought of it that way before. Inko wasn't done. I'm warning you now. If you ever harm Izuku again, I'll see to it that everyone knows just what you did to him, Inko warned. Katsuki stared at her stunned. Inko, deciding she'd said enough, started walking away. When a common room nighttime, most of the students had gone to bed, but he was still up finishing his work. It was nice to see his mother again, and he and Tokoyami had gotten a good bit of information today. Yumikage and Dark Shadow seemed even closer than before with Ascension being moving about freely. He hadn't encountered any of his other classmates today, though Fumikage said they were shocked at the event. That shock quickly turned to laughter when they learned Denki had blown his nose into Aizawa's capture weapon. Izuku got up and headed down to the common room because he decided he needed some tea. When he arrived, he noticed that Shoto was already there. Hey, he greeted. Hey, Shoto replied. Izuku didn't waste any time and got straight to the point. How'd your visit go today? He asked. Also, would you like tea? Yes, I'd like tea, Shoto replied. As for what happened, I'll wait till you've sat down. Izuku made the tea and was now sitting opposite Shoto. Taking a sip, Shoto began to tell his story. We came face to face for the first time in years. My mom started crying when she saw me, but it wasn't because of my left side, more of what she had done to it. She apologized, but I told her it wasn't her fault and forgave her a long time ago. I apologized for not coming sooner and told her about using my left side. She said she wanted me to be happy and save people. We hugged and we expressed how much we missed each other, Shoto explained. Izuku thought this scene sounded sweet. It reminded him of how he had encountered his mother again. When she said those words to me, I felt like a large weight had been lifted off my chest, Shoto exclaimed. Izuku raised an eyebrow. Does that mean? He started. Shoto nodded. I'll use it from now on, but for me, and not for him. This will be my first step, he said. But there was something else. I'll rescue her from that place one day, and I'll find out what happened to my brother, Shoto swore. It's what I have to do. Izuku didn't say anything about that. He thought it was an admirable goal. Just then, he noticed something about Shoto's left eye. He hadn't noticed it before, but it looked familiar. He didn't mean from Endeavor but from someone else. He just couldn't think of you. At an unknown location, the four individuals whom Razor had spared were moving as quickly as possible. They decided it would be best to take her advice and get away. The shark boy was called Kai, the cyclops called Ichi, and the cats were Nico and Neku. Alright, let's head this way, Ichi suggested. Before they could the earth collapsed, and they fell into a pit. They tried getting back up but were held down by the wind. Water surrounded them then and slammed them down, rendering them unconscious. Four figures loomed over them. Well, this is a pleasant surprise. The boss will love this won't he, said one. The others murmured in agreement. A raid at the Kiyashi Ward shopping mall will commence, said another figure. You'd all better be there. Class 1A dorms. We're almost done, Izuku stated. Yes, thankfully, Fumikage exhaled deeply. The two of them had spent most of their weekend on their project, and were almost finished. All homework assignments were done on weekend mornings, so they wouldn't be in the way. I can't believe you two got it done this quickly, Dark Shadow said incredulously. You don't waste time, do you? We don't have time to waste, Izuku replied in an emotionless voice. Fumikage remained silent. Dark Shadow was persistent, however. Early, not even a little. He pushed. Dark Shadow, Fumikage warned. The sentient being laughed. I know I'm just messing with you. He joked before turning serious. Maybe. Izuku and Fumikage sighed. Dark Shadow had a weird sense of humor. Izuku looked at the time on the clock in the library. When he did he jumped to his feet. Sorry, we're going to have to finish this later, Izuku exclaimed. I have a counseling session with Hound Dog. It's fine. You do what you need to do, Fumikage replied indifferently. Let's finish it tomorrow. We've been working all weekend, it wouldn't hurt to rest for the rest of the day. Izuku nodded in agreement. Though he wasn't exactly sure what to do with his free time. Hound Dog's office. Good evening Midoriya, Ryo greeted. How has your weekend been? It was alright I guess, Izuku responded quickly. I did homework, a project, saw my mother, the highlight of the weekend by the way, and dealt with a nuisance that that had been plaguing me for the past week for the pettiest and stupidest reasons. But I retained a stoic expression, and helped a student, Fumikage Tokoyami, with the most dangerous aspect of his quirk, he added. News travels fast among teachers. Izuku's expression didn't change. He expected as much. I think it's safe to say you've had a very eventful first week at UA, Ryo said softly. You couldn't be more right, Izuku responded dryly. Izuku sat down directly across from Ryo. Ryo pressed the start button on the recording device and began their session. Rather than go straight into the deep stuff Ryo decided it would be best to start off with a more casual subject. The other day you told me quirk analysis was one of your hobbies. Would you like to tell me about that? Ryo offered. 
Izuku could sense that Ryo was trying to start off with something simple, so he decided to indulge him. He was happy to tell him about his hobby. Work analysis is something I've been doing since I was a child, Izuku explained. When I was young I admired heroes a lot. So, I started to take notes on them. What the quirks were, how they were used, their weaknesses, ways to improve it, their fighting style, you name it. I took it down. I even did individuals I was around who were likely to become heroes like Bakugo. Ryo noticed Izuku was smiling when he talked about this. It appeared his quirk analysis skills were something he took pride in. Ryo had seen some of these notes alongside the teachers, Detective Tsukauchi showed them some. He'd be lying if he said he wasn't impressed. My quirk analysis abilities were the main reason the league recruited me, Izuku continued. If you took down notes on heroes, would I be correct in assuming that you wanted to be one yourself? Ryo asked. Izuku gazed down at the floor. I did. He paused. But I gave up on that dream about a year ago when I finally realized it wasn't possible. It took me 10 years to finally get the message. Message? Ryo said puzzled. Would you mind explaining that to me? Izuku took a deep breath. Quirkless people cannot be heroes. We're the useless weak members of society who aren't needed. We'd be destroyed by a villain the moment we came face to face with one, Izuku exhaled. That message. Ryo frowned. He didn't like that, not one bit. Quirkless people may have a disadvantage against those with quirks, but they were far from useless. And you've been told this since you were a child. Ryo pressed. Izuku nodded. Ever since I was diagnosed as quirkless. Ryo hummed. He had reached the part where things would get serious. What was your childhood like, along with your teen years? Ryo asked. Were they difficult? Izuku sighed. You have no idea. Sitting up straight he began to tell what he had told so many people before. The first few years of my life were okay. I played and got on with other children. I lived with my parents and things were fine. I desired a cool quirk like the other kids I was around. When it didn't show up I went to the doctor with my mom, and I discovered I was quirkless, he explained. That's when things really went to shit. Ryo ignored the bad language used in tense of what he was about to hear next. Kids I knew started to bully me because I didn't have a quirk. The cougar was one of them. They mocked me, stole from me, humiliated me, and beat the shit out of me every day. Others simply avoided me as though I were some rare disease, and because they didn't want to be bullied either. It continued from when I was 4 until I was 14 when I left school. Every day I would come home with new bruises and scars, which were mostly kept hidden, Izuku revealed. Izuku was staring at the wall while he said all this. He didn't notice the angry expression Ryo was beginning to make. The counselor was furious at what he was hearing. He despised bullying of all kinds. Izuku wasn't done. There was something else. Something he very rarely told anyone else. Come to think of it, Razor and his mother were the only ones he had ever really told. When Razor first saw his scars, she asked how he got them. He explained, only she could tell there was more to it than that, and eventually got the truth out of him. She didn't question it, she just trained him. This had been when they started and before he created the regenerative drug. He told his mother two days after the hospital battle, and her reaction wasn't pretty. He decided, since he was going through these sessions, he would be honest about his problems, well, not all of them. Mostly because of Razor's advice. Ryo noticed how tense Suzuku looked as he moved uncomfortably. My scars, the ones I received each day, not all of them were from bullies, Izuku said slowly. Ryo dreaded what was coming next. Sometimes, when I was alone at home when I couldn't take what I was going through. I, cut myself. I cut myself to make it go away. Ryo stared at Izuku in horror. This was far worse than he thought. Izuku hadn't just been bullied, he had been suffering from depression. Gulping down what he felt for the moment, Ryo spoke. Did you ever go to anyone about your problems? He asked. Izuku shook his head. My teachers didn't care about what I was going through. Sometimes they joined in. My mother I didn't tell because I didn't want to cause her trouble, Izuku explained. I told her a few weeks ago. She was horrified. If Ryo wasn't so shocked, he would have been furious at the descriptions of Izuku's teachers. Just what kind of school had he gone through that would allow that sort of treatment? He got the sense that Izuku wasn't telling him everything, though that wasn't important right now. I only did it occasionally. I didn't make a habit of it, Izuku confessed, much to Ryo's relief. The days when he did that were when he was at his most vulnerable, when he had been through more than what he went through most days. It was a terrible way he dealt with the stress he was feeling, though it was very rare. I haven't done it in over a year, Izuku admitted. There's been no need and I'm a much stronger person than I was then. That you are, Ryo agreed. Things weren't all bad back then. Times I spent with my mom were nice and peaceful. Ryo said nothing. He knew how close Izuku was with his mother. He even heard from Nezu that she was one of the reasons he left, so she could be safe. During these times when you were being bullied, how did you deal with your frustration? He asked. What did you do to channel your energy? Izuku thought about this for a minute. Mostly I did work to take my mind off things. I was never violent or broke anything, Izuku explained. I did develop some tendencies after joining the league, but I never attacked anyone unless I was provoked in some way. Ryo frowned. Were you provoked by anyone? 
Izuku considered this for a moment. Once, he admitted. What happened? Ryo asked. Izuku's face turned slightly anxious. The police already knew about this event from when they spoke with him again. They weren't happy about it, but let it go because he was defending someone else. It was a short wall before that whole kidnapping assignment. I went to the Kiyashi Ward shopping wall to find Tomura and talk to him about something. After I did that I was about to head back when I heard three boys beating up this other kid. They were all students in their teens. One of them was intent on burning the other boy. Initially, I was going to leave because it wasn't my problem, and it would only draw attention to myself. But then, Izuku paused. But then, Ryo pressed. Izuku breathed in deeply and exhaled. But then I heard he was quirkless, like me, Izuku admitted. Ryo's eyes widened. So that was the reason. There was someone in a similar situation to him. They started insulting and ridiculing him, the same way I once was, and, Izuku paused again. I don't know. I remembered everything I had gone through and, when I did, something inside me just snapped. Ryo tense for the next part. I attacked them, my face covered by my hood and scarf, head on. They didn't see me coming so I managed to defeat them quickly. The leader got back up and started bullshitting about quirkless people being heroes, and declared it was only for people like him. I told him he was nothing but a cowardly scumbag, and declared people like him couldn't be heroes. Then I broke his arm, forcing him and his lackeys to flee, Izuku exclaimed. Ryo looked at him with stunned silence. That wasn't exactly a heroic deed, but not a villainous one either. I'm not really sure why I acted that way. I've never lost control like that for someone I don't know, Izuku explained. Maybe it was because he was quirkless that I sympathized with him. That's just a guess though. Ryo had a different opinion on the matter. Maybe it's not about him being quirkless, he suggested catching Izuku's attention. You defended Hitashi Shinso from several bullies earlier in the week. Could it be that you sympathize with those who are bullied rather than just quirkless? Izuku thought about it. It was the main reason he held Tatashi that day. I suppose, he said. Ryo was starting to understand Izuku much better. He wasn't really a villain, just a troubled youth with a sad past. He helped others like him because he was still good at heart, those were signs of a hero. Though he did admit that breaking the boy's arm was a bit much. It seems that we are out of time Midoriya, Ryo announced. We shall pick this up on Tuesday. Same time, the same place. Izuku nodded and started to leave. He halted at the exit, however. Hey, is there a gym at this school? Izuku asked suddenly. I have some free time now so I thought it would be good to work out and relieve some stress. Actually, yes. It's close to Gym Gamma. Since you're already a student it's okay for you to use it, Ryo explained. Thank you, Izuku replied and left. Ryo sat there thinking about everything Izuku said. While he knew the boy had done wrong in his past he had done other things to make up for it. He wasn't born a villain, though the same could be said for every other villain. Ryo wasn't stupid. He was fully aware that most people became a villain due to certain circumstances. After all, he hadn't been born a hero, the opposite would have been just as possible back then. The situation with his brother had forced him to acknowledge that. Class 1A dorms. Most of the students were sitting in the common room together talking about the week they just had. In attendance were all the girls, Kirishima, Shoji, Mineta, Denki, Tenya, Ojiro, Sero and Aoyama. Sato was helping Koda look after certain animals. Bakugo was doing something. Shoto was out. Tokoyami was training. It's quite the week back hasn't it? Ojiro exhaled. I know right, Toru barked. First, we get a new classmate, who happens to be a quirkless villain. We do these battle trials with surprising results. Then we work on special moves. Then that new kid takes on Dark Shadow. On top of that, we got a project from Midnight Dew in a week. Ojiro and I just started. We should have started on Friday, but you thought it would be a good idea to go out, Ojiro deadpanned. One should never neglect work, and should get done as soon as possible, Tanya interjected. Yuraka and I have almost finished ours. Kaminari and I have ours done, Momo declared. Though I did most of the work. Hey, I was busy last night, Denki defended. Also, I'm not as good at study and work as Yuyu Rosu. And not much else either, Jiro added. A comment caused most of the class to start snickering, and Denki to curse. Mina remembered a question she'd been meaning to ask the others. And since it was the end of the week what a better time to ask it. So, now that's it been a week and all, what do you all think of Midoriya? She asked. There were glances between her classmates. Some weren't sure how to respond. Most of them hadn't interacted with Midoriya, so it was hard to say what they truly thought of him. Tenyu was the first to speak. I think he's a hardworking individual who gives his all in everything he does. He's supportive and while he doesn't actually want to be here he is trying his best to cope with it, Tenyu exclaimed. He's supportive alright, he gave me the reassurance I needed to win the race, and showed me a new way to use my quirk, Momo said. He did the same with me during the battle trial. He even defended me from the Kugo's attacks and dealt with Shinso's bullies, Achako piped up. He isn't a bad person, that's what I think anyway. At the mention of the fight, several students piped up. I still can't get over how intense that fight was, Sarah muttered. The way he took on the Kugo and Todoroki was so manly, Kirishima declared clenching his fist. 
He's definitely skilled in martial arts and weapon usage, Ojiro complimented. Whoever trained him did a good job. Yeah, good enough to put the two strongest students in the infirmary, Toru mumbled. And take on Dark Shadow in its strongest form, Dinky added. It was insane how he did it. I still can't believe it. I still can't believe you blew your nose into Mr. Ozawa's scarf, Jiro joked. The class started laughing again. Denki glared at Jiro. Must you insult me at every little thing I do, he yelled. Yes, Jiro bluntly replied. The class said nothing. They had grown used to the bickering between these two. He helped Tokoyami out with his quirk, and he's better than before, Asui stated. I don't think he's a bad person, so I have no problem with him. I agree, Shoji agreed. As long as he doesn't try anything I'm alright with him living here. He possesses a unique sparkle, Aoyama piped up. I don't like him, Mineta declared angrily. He's a villain. He should be locked away in prison. No one was surprised at Mineta's outburst. They knew he was angry at Midoriya for embarrassing him and getting all the girls, especially Midnight, to like him. Speaking of our new arrival, where is he? Asui asked. I haven't seen him all day. Midoriya was with Tokoyami for most of the day. Then I think some counseling session with Hound Dog Sensei, Tenya said. Principal's orders. As curious as they were about that they decided not to ask. I saw him earlier, Denki said. He was heading to the gym near Jim Gamma. Yue has a gym, Mina exclaimed. For working out and stuff. Denki nodded. Oh man, Kirishima moaned. I wish I'd known about that before. Then, an idea formed in his mind. He leapt up and started walking to the door. I'm gonna go and check it out, he declared. The students would have commented on that, only they remembered that this was Kirishima who loved this sort of thing. It was something he would see as manly. Since they had nothing better to do, they decided to follow and check out the gym themselves. Yue Jim. Smash. Izuku kicked a punching bag across the room. It didn't break, but it flew. He then placed back up and proceeded to practice some martial arts moves that Razor taught him to clear his head. There hadn't been anyone here to manage the gym. All you had to do was show your student card and you were in. Currently, Izuku was training very hard to pass the time. Because he was building up a lot of sweat he took off his t-shirt, exposing his six-pack abs and muscular arms. He wore these fingerless boxing gloves, provided by a vending machine, for training. He also went barefoot while training. That aside, Izuku had a lot on his mind. It had been a very eventful week for him, and, as much as he didn't want to admit it, he was settling into UA. He met people who were like him, and found that part of him enjoyed it here. It wasn't as bad as his life before the league, and he got to see his mother again. He couldn't allow it to last though. He was still loyal to the league and wanted to get back to them. Betraying them was unthinkable after everything they had done for him. He owed it to them, he owed it to Sensei. He wondered what things were like for Tomura's group. How were they managing? Were they still fighting? Had they been captured? Those were questions he needed answered. He wondered about Razor as well. Where she was, and what she was doing. She had probably gone back to Butler. It's what she said she would do. Izuku performed a turning kick with perfect speed and balance. He then flipped backwards and performed several more. Finally, he jumped, turning sideways, and spun several times to deliver a strong kick by bringing the heel of his foot down. He landed softly on his feet and exhaled. That when he heard something hitting the floor he turned and saw most of his classmates staring at him with stunned expressions. Those expressions changed depending on who saw him. The girls saw his muscles, and all began blushing uncontrollably. There was even a bit of blood leaking from Toru's nose. Kirishima and Sarah were starting to cry at Izuku's training. So manly, they sobbed. Even Aoyama was overwhelmed by Izuku's hard work. Mineta and Denki were glaring at Izuku. Their eyes blazing with envy at how much the girls were liking him, and his muscles. The other three retained calm expressions. Izuku decided to ask them what was going on since he was confused about the situation. All he had done was training, it wasn't anything special. Aida, Izuku called. Why are they all acting that way? Are they ill or something? Not that I'm aware of, Tenyu responded honestly. They're probably just surprised at your muscles since they've never seen them before. Izuku frowned. The boys must have seen them while he was changing, so why would they act that way? Why would that matter? Izuku asked innocently. The entire class stared at him dumbfounded. For someone so intelligent it was amazing how he couldn't understand why that was important. Then again, Izuku wasn't the most social person in the class, so maybe he didn't have any experience. You bastard. Mineta roared. Using your muscles to win the girls over. You truly are evil. Izuku was confused by Mineta's outburst. I'm not trying to win over anyone, Izuku retorted. What would my muscles have to do with it anyway? They just developed from the harsh training I did. They're not that big of a deal. Most of the class couldn't believe what they were hearing. Did Izuku truly not think that much of them? Besides, I'm sure the girls just find me more bearable since I'm not trying to sexually harass them. 24-7, Izuku deadpanned, causing Mineta to retreat. They're just muscles. I'm sure you've all seen them before. Why would I be so special? He had a point, though he was missing the main one. He means because you are half-naked the girls are acting that way, Denki explained. What do you think if you walked in on a girl that way? 
I wouldn't think anything of it, Izuku replied bluntly, much to everyone's surprise. I've been trained not to feel anything when a situation where I might walk in on someone not wearing anything may arise. Seduction doesn't work on me either. The class stared at him with their jaws dropped wide open. He does that mean you've seen a GGG girl and make, Mineta stammered. Izuku nodded. So, it's nothing I haven't seen before and am therefore unaffected by, Izuku deadpanned. The class stared at him with flabbergasted expressions. Izuku was truly a one of a kind. Sexual attraction was kicked out of me by the person who trained me, literally, he said as he prepared to leave. If that's all I'm going to leave. And so, he left, leaving everyone speechless. He absolutely did not want to think about that training Razor did with him. It was the most awkward of his life and one he wished he could forget. Izuku's room. After showering and returning to his room, Izuku completed what little homework he had before retiring for the night. Dream sequence. Izuku dreamed he was in a dark place. He was lying on the ground, bruised and beaten, a feeling he was quite familiar with. Next thing he knew he was on a bed with bandages wrapped around him. He took quite the beating out there, came a high voice. He turned to see a beautiful woman with short ocean blue hair and seaweed green eyes. She wore a blue bra, loose purple trousers, and open toed brown sandals. She also wore a bracelet on her left hand with the symbol of the moon on it. This was Yumi. You landed in a few good hits yourself, and I've never seen Lobo get pushed to that point, another high voice exclaimed. The woman with pink hair held back into pigtails and pink eyes appeared. She wore a white blouse with a silver musical note pattern, navy jean shorts and a set of pink trainers. In addition, she wore a bracelet on her right hand with a symbol of a musical note on it. Her facial features were quite like Yumi's. Fitting since she was her younger sister Yutada. Indeed, Yumi agreed. Speaking of which, what are you doing here Lobo? It's not often you check on your defeated opponents. You never check on them at all actually, Yutada corrected. Lobo growled. Izuku turned and saw his opponent from his previous fight. Lobo was a tall imposing individual with tan skin and a muscular build. Since he wasn't wearing his wolf mask his face was fully visible. Lobo possessed short black hair and piercing yellow eyes of a wolf, and facial features that were foreign. As for the rest of him, he had the appearance of a luchador wrestler. He wore black, white, red trim claws tights, boots that were covered with black, red, white spike kick pads, and black red fingerless gloves, with the picture of a wolf on them. Well, unlike most of my opponents, he didn't try to cheat, and actually managed to hurt me, Lobo pointed out. He fought fairly, and that's something that hasn't happened to me in a long time. His accent sounded Spanish, at least as far as Izuku could tell. That meant he was most likely from Europe or America. Before the memory could continue the scene changed to a different area where Izuku was lying on the ground. He was bleeding and in agony. The fight he was just in was going badly for him. His opponent, the sadistic bastard who ran this place, stood over him laughing maniacally. Light emanated from all over his body, but his white suit with blood marks was still visible. Time to die Deku, he sneered in a cruel deep voice as he extended his hand, and light started flashing. Dream sequence end. Izuku shot straight up. He was sweating and breathing heavily. He quickly got out of bed and grabbed some water that was on his desk. He drank it to get his breathing back under control. Once he settled down, he got back into bed and stared at the ceiling. What are they? Izuku wondered. What do they mean? Are they real? The hallucinations have been coming more frequently now, mostly in the form of dreams. However, Izuku couldn't make sense of any of it. The dreams, the hallucinations, they felt so real. Like they were memories. He was not sure how it was possible, since he rarely interacted with anyone outside the league. And he was certain he would remember those people and events if they were real, wouldn't he? With the students. So, hey, this Wednesday. We all have a day off due to some security improvements. Why don't we all go shopping, Toru suggested. The students murmured in excitement. Let's go to the Kiyashi Ward shopping mall again, Min urged. I love that place. The students all agreed and began to make plans. Monday at the police station, Dobby was called in because he had a visitor. He expected it to be a detective looking for more answers, but was even more surprised by who it was. Sitting across from him now was Inko Midoriya, Deku's mother. Hello Dobby, she greeted. I have some questions if you don't mind asking. Thanks for listening. I do hope you enjoyed. If you want the next part of this video, like subscribe and comment down below, and turn on the bell notification. And also check out other videos that I have created and enjoy. See you in the next video. Peace.